Let's continue deterrorizing scary verses. We're going to look at the vine and the branches, and fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. This is a series exploring passages which religion has perverted and corrupted in order to abuse, manipulate, intimidate, and terrorize people. And so we're going to start with the vine and the branches. And we're going to take a look at what it actually says versus how it is presented. And there might be a little bit of exaggeration here for effect. But basically, we're going to read into the verse the way that religion reads into the verse. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears forth not fruit, he takes away and casts into eternal hellfire. And every branch, even though it bears fruit, he purges it in eternal hellfire that it may bring forth more fruit even though it's dead and burning in an eternal hellfire. Now ye are totally depraved in spite of the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing, except that you have to do it by yourself, on your own, by your strength, with your own free will decision to cling bitterly, persevere to the end, pick up your cross daily, crucify your flesh, and bear forth much fruit by your own efforts. Make sure that Christ is dead in vain by being your own crucifix. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and, wither and is withered, and God gathers them and casts them into eternal hellfire, and their men gather them. This must be that heretical West Cotton Hort transcript. Who put that there? Men gather them. Indeed. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. That sounds encouraging. Is this the Mandela effect? I bet it's the Mandela effect. It's one or the other. It's West Cotton Hort or the Mandela effect. This encouraging stuff does not belong here. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear forth that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples, but only if you bear that fruit. So get to work. Get to work. You know what? I'm thinking that maybe this is actually saying, like, you abide in the vine, and he's the vine, and the father's the husbandman, and they do all the work, and you're just the branch, and the fruit pops out. Boop! It pops out on you. Like, you're... Boop! You know, because... All that stuff is flowing through the vine, out through the branches, and then at the end of the branch, that's where the fruit pops out. You don't really do anything. You don't have a say. You don't get a vote. You don't do the job. You just abide. Just chill and abide and be part of the vine. Because if the root is holy, then the branch is holy. And why would God be sitting there going like, well... You weren't holy enough. I'm going to throw you into hell forever. I don't know. Does that make sense? If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's. There you go. You got to keep the Ten Commandments. And don't look at verse 12 to find out what my commandments are. Whatever you do, do not get context by looking at verse 12. So we're going to skip that. We're going to go right to verse 11, which... Uh oh. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Huh. This is definitely that heretical West Cotton Hort text. Because there is no joy in this passage. There's fear and threats of hellfire and eternal damnation. And why would your joy be full from that? That is definitely not part of the text. That doesn't belong there. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Hmm. Call me crazy, but I don't see where your joy is full when you're being threatened with eternal conscious torment. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Wait, that's not the Ten Commandments. That's love one another as I have loved you, which... Kind of seems like if you understand if he how much he's loved you, then maybe you could love one another the same way. 
And it also kind of seems like, like if you don't understand how much he's loved you, then maybe you don't really know. And, and, oh, oh, I know, I know. Because we need to read the word commandment like it says ultimatum. You do it or you die and go to hell. This is my ultimatum on threat of die and go to hell. That you love one another as I have loved you. Or you're going to die and go to hell. That's the way we got to read. There we go. This is my ultimatum. That you love one another or die and go to hell. Greater love has no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends? Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Good, good, good. There's an if. If ye do whatsoever I command you. Ha, 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 ha. There we go. We still get to cast people into hell. Because there's an if. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. If you do whatsoever I command you. Otherwise, you're not my friends. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you totally depraved sinners. Wait. Mandela effect. Where did you put in this thing? I have called you friends. That's not right. For all the things I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. That ye should go and f bring forth fruit. There you go. Or else you're going to die and go to hell. And that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask of... <sighs> I'm really getting tired of this text that's like been changed since this morning when I read it earlier. That whatsoever ye shall ask in, of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Ha ha! We got another ultimatum. These things I command you with an ultimatum that you love one another or die and go to hell. Perfect. Perfect. We get to end it right there. We got an ultimatum to finish it off. You know, but see, here's the thing is in chapter 14, let's back up a little bit. It starts with, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. That's a little weird. Why is he saying, let not your heart be troubled? That doesn't make any sense. And then we continue on. He says in verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Wait, 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 wait. We're supposed to seek the Lord while he may be found because he's going to hide himself from you soon. Then it's going to be too late because his mercy doesn't endure forever. It dies when you do. There's a, there's a whole psalm, you know. It's like, praise the God of Jacob for his mercy dies when you do. Or something like that. I, I didn't think about think ahead to plan ahead and look that one up. Um, I'm pretty sure it's there, though. It's something about how his mercy dies when you do. Um, so anyway, in verse 26, he says, But the accuser, which is the Holy Ghost, wait, the comforter, he's supposed to accuse you day and night. Isn't that what the Holy Ghost does? You know, convicts you of your sin. Look at, what, look at all the things you've done wrong, you filthy, disgusting sinner. Why would he comfort you? That makes no sense. <sighs> Whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things. Teach? What? And bring all things to you. Remember whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. Peace is from the devil. We know that. You know, it's always the false prophets that preach peace. You know, Jerusalem, the teaching of peace, and the prince of peace, and the king of peace, and Solomon, the peace, and Melchizedek, the king of Salem, which means peace. But peace is from false prophets and the devil. Even though it's one of the fruits of the Spirit, you know. But anyway, let's ignore that. Let's, we'll shelve that for now because it doesn't fit our narrative. Okay, so peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And so then let's pick up from there and we'll, we'll tell people about hellfire and brimstone and not bearing enough fruit so that their joy may be full. Because that makes sense. To religion. Not to me. I don't know. For some reason that doesn't make sense to me. I, I can't quite figure out how these pieces go together. It's a little weird. It's a little strange. I'm going to work it out somehow. One way or another we'll figure it out. Because clearly this is about being cast in hell for eternal conscious torment. And never ending unrelenting pain. Because God is a violent, vengeful, sadistic or something like that. So here we go. That's the vine and the branches. And then we get to Matthew chapter 10.
And we look at verse 28, and it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. That's some good stuff right there. That's some good preaching. All right. We're preaching now. People are going to hell. But here's the thing. That's actually the middle of a passage where he's telling you not to be afraid. The conclusion is to have no fear. So let's back up a little bit. Matthew chapter 10, starting at verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents, serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. They will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. So here he's telling you to beware of men. They're going to do bad things to you. But when they deliver you up, take no thought, which means not to be worried, not to have fear. When they deliver you up, take no thought, how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given to you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaks in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. There we go. That's a good one. You've got to endure to the end. Otherwise, you're going to go to hell. It's coming up. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Wait, now, let's just pause for a second. Who's being called Beelzebub? Jesus! They're calling him the devil. They said he has a devil. They said he's a drunkard and a glutton, and he's born of fornication. And that he committed blasphemy because he called God his father, which made him equal to God. Don't think that one through too thoroughly, because if you consider God to be your father, you might be in trouble, according to religious people. So whatever you do, make sure that you've got some kind of, like, junior Holy Spirit, or, like, subordinate to Jesus kind of son of God. Because otherwise, blasphemy. Fear not there. Wait, what? Fear not. Fear. Okay. Fear them not, therefore. Okay, but the, but do be afraid of God. We're going to get to it. Don't worry. It's, it's cool. Don't be afraid of the men, but we got to be afraid of God. It'll come up. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather be very afraid of him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father? But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Wait, so the conclusion was not to be afraid? So this would be kind of like saying, you know, the only thing you have to be afraid of is the guy that's your defender and protector and provider and healer. So there's nothing to be afraid of because he's your defender and protector and provider and healer, not your accuser. That might be what the point is. Maybe. I like here in the Luke version. Wait a minute. It did say that in the Matthew version. Even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Somehow I missed that. So... What this reminds me of is that in Matthew chapter 6, it says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor for yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are ye not much better than they? That sounds pretty similar to what he was saying about the sparrows, and you are much worth much more than the sparrows. This passage, entire passage, is about not worrying because your father is the provider. 
Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into... It, yeah! Yeah! It's cast into hellfire! All right! We got it. Yes! Shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye li of little faith? Therefore, take no thought. Why does it only do it? <sighs> Stupid Westcott and Hort Mandela effect. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall have take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And I like how in Luke it says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Stupid Mandela effect. <laughs>